Hello, Mr. Yu. Now let's start off by discussing what's on everyone's mind, uh, the US-China relations. Now you mentioned in your book, Game Theory, you said that China prefers a win-win situation, but if the US forces its hand into a win-lose situation, then China's prepared to move to the lose-lose quadrant. Given the heightened economic and political um, tensions between the two powers, mm. Do you foresee both sides moving into a lose-lose, zero-sum situation? China will not push the U.S. into a win-lose quadrant because it doesn't want to escalate. It knows that it's getting stronger and that its relative strength vis-a-vis -vis the U.S. will improve over time. So its strategy is not to escalate, but at the same time to show no weakness. So when the U.S. tries to push China into a win-lose quadrant, China will then move into lose-lose instead to put a cost onto the U.S. so that eventually, over time, it will see advantage in moving to the win-win quadrant. So that's the way the Chinese uh, are playing this. Uh, for the U.S., uh, it's not one player. There are many players uh, with their own agendas. And sometimes this creates confusion, particularly at a time when the leadership in the U.S. is weak. And, you know, with this other U.S. congressional visit you know, to Taiwan so soon after Speaker Nancy Pelosi's visit. What do you think the U.S. was trying to achieve by this? And what's your assessment of how China has responded? I think these congressional delegations, what they call Cordells, are not new. I think they've always sent them to, to Taiwan. But coming so soon after the Pelosi visit naturally assumes greater significance and almost seems as if uh, it's a deliberate escalation. I'm not so sure because uh, these things have been arranged months in advance. The US, there are some people who just want to irritate China, want to bring down China's prestige in the world, uh, if they can. Uh, there are others who, who may be baiting China to do something silly, then they can uh, respond vigorously. I think in the U.S., there are, there are a number of players. On the Chinese side, they're quite unified. It's the tradition of centralized statecraft in China. But the U.S. have always had a division of powers. And sometimes this leads to a certain incoherence uh, in the actions, which China has got to take into account when it does its calculation. What do you think China would do now? Well, China is very clear. It's made it uh, unambiguous that if the U.S., uh, supports China, Taiwan independence, then uh, China will use all means to prevent it from happening and may well uh, create the very outcome which some in the U.S. claim they don't want to see, which is violent uh, reunification. Uh, but uh, by action or inaction, the U.S. may, may actually create the very outcome uh, which they do not like to see. Uh, but in the end, it falls back onto uh, the military uh, balance of power. And without nuclear weapons, I think it's hard for the US to be confident that it can prevail uh, in a war over Taiwan because the US is far away, whereas it's at China's doorstep. So the, the theater of operations favors China, even though Taiwan is still uh, well, quite a distance away from, from the mainland. But nevertheless, if, if for China is one, 200 miles away, for the U.S. is thousands of miles away. So it's much harder for the U.S. to sustain a conflict over Taiwan without the, new, the use of nuclear weapons. So the U.S. will always try to make that a direct or indirect threat uh, to which China has to uh, have a response, which is why I think they will increase the number of warheads and which is why the South China Sea is so important because of China's strategic submarine fleet in the South China Sea. In 1991, you likened uh, the state to a banyan tree, which needs to be pruned in order to enable civic discourse to flourish. 57 years since Singapore's independence, do you think civic discourse has flourished in Singapore? And how should the new generation of leaders engage with this space? The relationship between what I described as a banyan and the growth beneath is not unilateral. I think it's, it's a, 
it's dynamic. It's, it's almost an interaction, a conversation between the, the ferns and the other creepers and the banyan and together creating a, a symbiosis. Uh, Singapore can succeed if it is without clear, decisive leadership. The world doesn't wait for us. We have to adjust to the world, which means that if there are dangers, move quickly. If there are opportunities, strike quickly. So Singapore requires a certain unity of purpose and decisiveness of action. But at the same time, we can only do this if we have a genuine unity, which is not forced, which is not uh, procrastinate, but which results from a uh, continuing conversation and most importantly, a uh, relationship of trust. Has it changed since I made that speech in the early 90s? Oh yes, profoundly. I think Singapore is much more variegated now. It's, it's almost a garden beneath the banyan tree. And there are all kinds of uh, wonderful flowers and groves. Uh, but nothing is static. We have to keep adjusting, uh, adapting. And what, in your view, are the key challenges that the 4G leaders will need to deal with amid this flourishing garden? But there are two things. One is uh, clarity about the way the world is going as best we can. Uh, the world is going through profound changes. There will be a protracted uh, struggle between the US and China, and to a certain extent between the West and the rest. Because for the first time in a long time, uh, the West and the US feel that, oh, they are not necessarily top dog in the world. And Asians and the Chinese are prepared to look them in the eye, at eye level, and say, no, I disagree. You can't do this. They may not be used to it, but they will have to get used to it. So during this period, there's bound to be tension, there's bound to be conflict. I describe it as an intertidal period. And it's not static. From time to time, there appears to be a surface calm. But that calm is ephemeral. It's because one tide is now resisting the other tide. But the tides continue with their own momentum. And one day, it will move in the opposite direction. And in between, there could be turbulence. There could be whirlpools. And we have to be very careful and position ourselves early in the right places. Because if we find out too late that these are the causes of the currents, we may not have time to get into, get into the right position. You will just be sucked down. So I think clarity about the external environment is critical, as best we can. And this clarity comes not just from information and watching what's happening. I think it requires also an understanding of history and culture. History and culture are enduring. They don't change very quickly. So these things create a, a nature to the tides we're talking about. I mean, the tides don't move as they will. They follow certain courses. The tides have ebbed and flowed in the past, studied how they float in the past. Then therefore, it gives you a fair sense of how they will rise in the future. The key is we must be united. If we are united, we'll be able to respond early and effectively. Uh, but if we are disunited, and then we spend all our time calling over how the deck chairs to be arranged on the deck while icebergs are <laughs> looming all around us, then we will very quickly be in trouble. So I would say there's an internal dimension which requires a continuing effort at keeping Singaporeans who are diverse uh, together. And there's an external environment which is going through a historic transformation. And I found this quote of yours interesting. You said, um, if we are insecure about our own identity, then we become uncomfortable with the strength of other people's identity. And something Singaporeans are told, you know, you shouldn't be pro-China, you shouldn't be pro-US, you shouldn't be this, you shouldn't be that. So then the question some people ask is, so who are we? Um, do you think after all these years, you know, we have strengthened our national identity and become more comfortable with who we are as a people? Let me say this, that uh, this internal debate uh, will never cease. Uh, if Singapore is defined by what we can't be, I think it's not a very attractive Singapore. 
if the common space is created by each of us being less of himself or herself, then it may even be suffocating. The hope I have, as I express not only in the first series, but in all three series, is that we have a big Singapore, that the unity is created not by how much each has to retreat to create some common space, but how each, by growing his heart and enlarging his mind, can create a greater overlap. So the bigger you are, the greater overlap we enjoy as Singaporeans, and that is our common space. So one is a positive sum game, the other is a zero sum game. We must create a positive sum Singapore. Then if you are Chinese or Indian, you come to Singapore, say, yeah, here I'm bigger than what I was. Because in addition to being what I was, I'm not expected to be more than that. Easier said than done, but something worth striving for. It will make us perhaps a flickering possibility of what the future might be for others in the world. We used to be homogeneous. Now we are diverse in London and New York and other places. And you have your habits and I have mine. And each impinges upon the other. But in Singapore, perhaps we can create a meta system, a meta culture, where in addition to who you are and what you are, we can be more than that. And therefore, find a higher unity. I'd like to say if one day, let's say Earth is under threat and we could send a Noah's Ark, Noah's Ark to Mars. And we're all drawn right, in different pairs from Chinese, India, Africa, US, Europe, other places. Do we go to Mars as Chinese, as Indians, as Westerners, or do we go as human beings? I don't think you can say we suddenly deprogram ourselves and download new program and become generic human beings. I don't think that's possible. We don't even know what's inside us that we've inherited from our ancestors. So the only way that we can be together on this voyage, confronting common challenges, if we have higher values, which says, yes, you are Indian, you are Chinese, you are Jewish, whatever, but the additional lines of code, like TCPIP, you know, HTML, XML, or whatever, which enables us to interconnect, to find higher purpose, and to cohere. That is what Singapore should be. Something larger than what we were before. Your name has come up from time to time uh, as president. Um, can you recap for our readers, why is it that you don't wish to run in next year's presidential election? I'd like to give a, a, a clear, definitive answer that I, I do not wish to run for the presidency and I give my reason for doing so because it is a very important institutional position and it requires great discipline. You have powers, but you also sometimes have to act under advice and you cannot lightly uh, speculate on your views about things. There has to be... Uh, a certain discipline of thought and action. Do I fit this role? Uh, I was asked in 2011, do you remember, when I lost the elections? I, I was not happy, even when I considered it. I asked myself, am I happy? I said, no, I'm not happy at the prospect. I feel some pressure. So you ask me that question, I, I give you the same clear reply that I have no intention of running for the election. And I, because friends ask me to reconsider and I tell them, now I've thought over this deeply. Yeah, and this is, this is a, a firm position. Thank you, Mr. Yo. My pleasure. <laughs>